Let us read together James 1, verses 1 through 18. The first 18 verses of James 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, Count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but that patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat But it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, Neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. (coughs) Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of the first fruits of his creatures. Amen. James 1, verses 16 and 17. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The first of those two verses, beloved, is a transition. It looks back to the preceding verses and forward to the succeeding verses. And you can even apply verse 16 to everything that goes before in James 1 regarding temptations and trials someone says trials make my life miserable do not err my beloved brethren count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials or God is stingy he only gives a very little in response to prayer. Do not err, my beloved brethren, because if anyone lacks wisdom or anything good, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. That's the promise. Well, if I doubt in my prayers it really doesn't make much difference but let him ask in faith says verse 6 and if he wavers let that that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord do not err my beloved brethren poverty makes gladness impossible Do not err, my beloved brethren. Let the brother of low degree rejoice 
in that he is exalted in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Nothing good comes through my trials and temptations, either in this life or in the next. But verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which God hath promised to them that love him. So do not err, my beloved brethren. And then especially this, in verses 13 through 15, you know, I reckon that at the end of the day, it's actually God who tempts me. And I think there's a sense in which he wants me to sin. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Do not err, my beloved brethren. God isn't the author of sin. God isn't the author of temptation. And God isn't the tempter. Satan is. And then especially this too. When I succumb to temptation, I don't think it's really that big a deal. But the scripture says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So it now it's out of the mind and it's visible either or audible. You can see it or you can hear it. It's manifesting itself to other people. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. This transition, verse 16, applies to what follows. And we'll consider that at the end of this sermon, Lord willing. Let's look at every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift. The meaning of it, the source of it, and the errors regarding it. Every good and perfect gift. The meaning of it, the source of it, and the errors regarding it. Every good and perfect gift, says James, is from above. And right at the start, we need to ask, to whom? What party or what parties are in view as the recipients in our text? Is it referring to every good and perfect gift to Jesus Christ or to the angels, whether good or evil, or to the unbelieving reprobate or to God's people? who are chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and called by the Spirit? And the answer is the people of God. Listen again to how this book begins. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren in Christ. And then immediately before verse 17 we read, do not err, my beloved brethren. And immediately after it we have, of God's own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so verse 17, the bit that refers to every good and perfect <coughs> gift being from above, verse 17 is sandwiched between verses 16 and 18, with their particular reference to believers as regenerate and beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift to us is the idea, though the words aren't formed there, found there, but it's supplied properly from the preceding and the succeeding verse and indeed the address of the epistle. Every good gift and every perfect gift to us is from above. And we're not going to deal with the other parties because they're not the focus of this text. And once you have to start doing that, things get unnecessarily complicated. 
What then is included in the good and perfect gifts? Well, obviously, they include all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And in fact, one major commentator in great detail says that the good and perfect gifts only in this passage refer to these blessings, such as regeneration, the subject of verse 18 and tonight's sermon, the forgiveness of sins, peace with God, redemption, and they are all very clearly good and perfect gifts. But I agree with the majority of commentators that the good and perfect gifts here include physical gifts in the creation too. And we start with the astronomical bodies, the sun and the moon and the stars, because every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh from the Father of lights. Lights is plural. If it said the Father of light, it could refer to God's own being. But when it says the Father of lights, plural, it is referring to the heavenly bodies and the light that they bear. And indeed, the role that they play in marking time, whether days or seasons or years. Good and perfect gifts to us. Staying with the context too, to understand what the good and perfect <laughs> gifts are, verse 18 refers to creatures. The fish and the birds, good gifts. The animals and the insects, perfect gifts. The grass and the bushes and the trees, good gifts to us, says the church. The valleys and the mountains and the rivers, and the oceans perfect gifts to us this is what the passage is saying and here are some other good and perfect gifts to us our money our homes our possessions our health and so we could continue but you get the drift and let me give you three texts <coughs> which prove that all things and more are gifts to us from God in heaven. John the Baptist said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. John 3 verse 27. The Apostle Paul, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7. And here James says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. But you might think, how are these things good gifts? And how are they perfect gifts? Because the word good and the word perfect can mean different things in different places to different people. Let's say you buy a car that gives you a lot of trouble. You wouldn't call it a good car. I'm not faulting you, that's a bad car. I've been in and out of the garage with it five times in the last two months. I bought a lemon. But I didn't know. How was I to know? It was a dump. Hopefully I'll get a better one next time. It's costing me a fortune. You wouldn't call it a good car. It's a bad one. It's the worst one you've had for years. And it's certainly far from perfect. <laughs> We said that insects are a good gift from God to the church, but what about an insect that bites you? A wasp, or a bee, or a tick that gives you Lyme disease, or a mosquito from which you contract malaria. Let me read you some verses from Psalm 119. The section 65 through 72, we're going to sing it later. Verse 65, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. God dealt well with him. Verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy words. So the affliction was God dealing well with him. 
with the result that now he keeps God's word more faithfully. Verse 68, thou art good, that's the nature of God, and doest good, that's the works that proceed from the God of light, teach me thy statutes. Verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. So God is good, he does good, his afflicting us is good, because it is a good end, we learn God's statutes and we do not stray, at least not to the degree we did before. And not only are the trials or afflictions, not only are they good gifts, Psalm 119 says they are, good gifts from God, including car trouble and insect bites, but also painful chastisements that God administers in his love to correct his erring saints. Here's Hebrews 12, verse 10. Our earthly parents for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. And there's a true statement if ever there was one. But God chastens us, that's the supply, but God chastens us for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So that chastisement then is a good and perfect gift. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, it certainly doesn't, but grievous, oh yes. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So all these things then, afflictions, chastisements, trials, are gifts of God and they're good gifts coming from a good God with a good purpose, our sanctification, and they're perfect gifts, not that you bought a perfect car or that the insect bite, which meant you had to go to hospital while on holiday, made your holiday just perfect, but they're perfect gifts in that they are perfectly fitted to the end of God's glory in our conformity to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you several texts that explain and develop this, because it's not just James teaching this. Genesis 50, verse 20. But as for you, Joseph says to his brothers, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God meant it for good. It was a good gift. Joseph being sold into slavery, falsely accused, thrown into prison. Good. A good gift. Because of God's purpose. Not that it was pleasant. And the good purpose of God was the salvation of his church. Romans 8 verse 28. For all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Good. All things good. Not in themselves, not separately, but together, and all things working together for good as a good gift, because there's a good purpose which is conformity to the image of God's Son, the next verse tells us. And the text says, we know this. Everybody here knows this. You knew it without me telling you. There's a lot of things you know without the minister telling you. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the call according to his purpose of election and predestination. That's Christian knowledge, and that's a confession of our faith. And 1 Corinthians 3 teaches the same thing. Verse 21, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life or death, or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God. 
All things. Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. The apostles, ministers, elders, deacons. They're all yours. The world is yours. And everything in it. Life is yours and death is yours. Things present are yours. And things to come are yours too. And all these things are ours as gifts. As good gifts. And they are ours because they are Christ's. And they're Christ's because they're God's. God gives them to Christ in his exaltation. Christ our head possesses them for us. And rules over all these things for his glory in our salvation. So all these things are ours as good and perfect gifts. Achieving the end, the good end, God has purposed. And now James 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. They come to us in the channel of God's covenant of grace with us in Jesus Christ serving the covenant fellowship of the saints with our heavenly father that's what the text is saying and now we need also however to mark the contrast between verse 17 which we've been exploring and the preceding verses temptation is mentioned in verse 13 let no man say when he is tempted why oh, am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Temptation, as we saw last week, comes from Satan, as the one who loves sin and who wants to get us to sin. And so that temptation doesn't come from God. Yet God decrees the temptation eternally and providentially governs the temptation. The temptation comes from Satan, but not without the decree and providence of Almighty God. So what the devil intends for our sin and destruction, Jehovah uses to try our faith so that we seek wisdom and grow in faith and patience and become complete. Temptation is the subject of verse 13. Temptation leading to sin is what's treated in verses 14 and 15. Every man is tempted and succumbs to temptation. That's the idea there. Every man succumbs to temptation when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin when it hath finished, bringeth forth death. Sin is not of God. <coughs> Sin is of man. It comes of his own lust. And that's how we experience it too. We were tempted. We succumbed. It came from within us. We yielded. And it's our fault. And Sin therefore is of God. Is of Satan rather. The father of lies. Here's James 3, 14 through 16. If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above. Wisdom descends from above, but this sort of wisdom doesn't descend from above. It is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. And yea, the devil is there too. Adding that last part, just for good measure. And yet the righteous God, who hates and who avenges sin, decrees sin, and he providentially governs it for his own high and holy ends. So every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, but we need to distinguish and explain clearly the idea of temptation and how the devil is the tempter and sin and how yet God is sovereign over it all in his decree and providence. And now we must consider from this word of God how Jehovah is the source 
of every good and perfect gift from the perspective of verse 17. Jehovah is the source of every good and perfect gift as the one who is lofty. The lofty one. And there are three things in verse 17 that makes this clear. The good and perfect gift is from above. From heaven. From God who is above. And therefore it cometh down from above. And it cometh down, says James, from the Father of lights, the heavenly bodies, which are billions of light years from us. Some of them are. And yet God must be infinitely high to be above all of these heavenly bodies that are so far above us. And now Isaiah 55 says, God speaking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so it is too with the good gifts that we receive from him. His thoughts and ways make every gift good and perfect for the goals that he has proposed, even though we may experience them as what we think the very last thing that we needed. God says they're good and perfect, and we have to believe that. God is the source of every good and perfect gift. Secondly, as the one who is light, not only high up, but bright, shining light. Because the text says that he is the father of lights, the bright burning sun, and the stars, many of which are far brighter than the sun. And the father of such lights must be and is an infinitely brilliant <coughs> In fact, he is the God who is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Absolutely and spotlessly holy and pure, infinitely radiant and clear in his knowledge of himself and all things and all possibilities even. God is the source of every good and perfect gift as the lofty one who is light and who is our Father. And this is suggested by the divine name Father of Lights. Because if God is the Father of the sun and the moon and the stars, you might think that's a wee bit of a stretch, but it's not, it's true, it's biblical. Well, how much more isn't he the Father of rational, moral creatures whom he has adopted and regenerated by his grace in Jesus Christ? If God's the Father of some star, millions and billions of light years away, well, he's certainly my father for Jesus' sake. And as father, his love and power and wisdom are behind each and every one of the gifts that he gives us, determining which gifts, at what time, in which combination, so that they are always good and perfect gifts serving our salvation. Now it's all very clear. And it's all very logical, isn't it? And everybody, I trust, assents to this. But the difficulty is in believing it. And then our text highlights one of the divine attributes or perfections. Look at verse 17. Which one is it? <coughs> It is God's immutability or his unchangeableness. Because it says, regarding the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness or variation, neither shadow of turning. No turning, no changes, not even the shadow of it. And this is deliberate 
because it refers to the Father of lights, the heavenly bodies. And it's saying, well, God is this, unlike the sun. The sun varies. The astronomers tell us that there is a sunspot cycle of 11 years. So it gets a little bit hotter or brighter and it moves around. The sun varies with the time of the day, it sure does, and with the seasons of the year. Yeah, don't we know it? And the moon also varies. We talk about the moon waxing and waning. We have the full moon and we have the crescent moon until there's just a little outline, a semicircle on one side. The stars vary. One star is brighter than another. 1 Corinthians 15 even states that. And the constellations move across the night sky. And they are different too in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And with these variations in the sun and the moon, not so much the stars now, at least as perceived by us on earth, with these variations in the sun and the moon come changes in the shadows that they cast. The start of the day and the long, and the end of the day, that's the period of the long shadows. And I suppose we can talk about the short shadows when the sun is directly overhead around noon. And the moon even casts shadows. Though these are most obvious, of course, when there's a full moon and a cloudless night. The point of this word of God is that with the Almighty, there are no variables, no changes, no variations, and not even a shadow of turning. Absolutely, infinitely, perfectly immutable or unchangeable. Which raises the question, why is the immutability of God brought up here? Why not his mercy or his faithfulness? In what aspect is God immutable? And in what aspect is he presented as immutable from the perspective of this text? Well, God is immutable or unchangeable in his being as spirit and life, as rich fellowship and joy. His being never changes. But it's not the focus here. God is unchangeable in his persons as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, with the Father eternally begetting the Son and the Son eternally begotten of the Father and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeding from both. He's never going to become two persons or four persons. He never was six persons. All true, but not the idea of James 1.17. And if we move to God's attributes or perfections, he's unchangeably holy, unchangeably righteous, unchangeably wise and omnipotent. His love never changes either. We'll say more about that this evening, Lord willing. But this isn't the perspective of James 1, 17. And if we move from God's being and perfections and persons to his will in his eternal decree or counsel, with that all-embracing plan, it too is unchangeable. He hasn't changed, and he won't change, a single particular of it. Even if all the angels in heaven begged and pleaded with him to do so. Not a single bit of it's going to change. But that isn't the perspective of our text. The point here is that the God, who is absolutely unchangeable in himself... And in his eternal plan or counsel is perfectly immutable as regards the gifts which he gives to his children. And when I say as regards the gifts, I mean as regards the motivation in giving the gift and as regards the purpose and result in giving the gifts. 
always given to us out of love, seeking our welfare in Jesus Christ to the honour of his name. Which means that God never gives us anything out of hatred or out of some lesser love whereby he's, he's miffed with us and he sort of gives it to us in a begrudging kind of way. And he never gives us anything in order to punish us or to destroy us. The first article of our three forms of unity, Article 1 of the Belgic Confession, says that God is immutable and he's good. And we can put the two together and say he's unchangeably good. And at the end it says he is the overflowing fountain of all good. He's immutably good as the overflowing fountain of all good, giving us good and perfect gifts. This explains the repetition of the word gift in our translation. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Why didn't the apostles say every good and perfect gift? That's the way I rendered it in the sermon title because you want to keep sermon titles where possible shorter. But there are two nouns in the original. A good gift and a perfect gift. And the reason is that the two words, rightly translated gift, have a different emphasis. The first one, every good gift, emphasizes the act of giving. And the second one, every perfect gift, emphasizes the thing that is given. And the text says that the act of giving and the thing that is given is good and perfect coming out of the good and perfect will of God and for good and perfect ends appointed by him. And that this is immutably so. Even if we think, boy, I sure like the good things that my neighbor has gotten and that guy in the church and she's doing well for herself. And why doesn't God give me some of those things? And look at the rotten things I get. One rotten thing after another. Verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift to us and to each child of God is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And so, beloved, we come more briefly now to the errors regarding every good and perfect gift. And as I hinted earlier, the first and most obvious error and the way in which, I dare say, every last one of us goes wrong is that we have problems with the word every. Every. And not just every good gift, they're the ones that come from God, but the other ones that aren't good, it means all of these things are gifts and all of them are good and perfect. Every last one of them. And our problem with that is that we can see that some of them are good and perfect and we're happy with them and thankful to God for them, but there's other ones that that even though you've heard this sermon, you're still thinking to yourself, I think his exegesis is right. I think that's what the passage is saying. But you know what? I still don't believe it. And I'll never believe it. Every gift is good and perfect. Bar none. And this is why James, maybe even more than most, possibly even more than all, is always calling us to faith. Do we believe this? Every one of them is good. Every one of them is perfect. And it's a struggle for us. It's a struggle for us when the hard times come to believe it at the time. And it's a struggle for us too with regard to certain things that have happened to us, befallen us, things that have cropped up in our pathway in the past. Every last one of them are good and perfect. They came down from God and we mustn't attribute to him any evil purpose or even a general good purpose, but just for that moment. 
there was a wee bit of variableness. There was a certain amount of darkness. And God was in a bad mood and upset. And he lost his temper. And he gave us things that there was a wee bit of spite in them. No. Every good gift and every perfect gift that comes from above, from the Father of lights, no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There may be variableness with that star up there, even though you might need a really powerful telescope to see it, but certainly there wasn't any and there never will be any with God. And we notice too the connection between verses 16 and 17. Do not err my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Beloved. Beloved by God. And so this text too takes us to the cross. Because that's always our struggle with unbelief. The cross. Because every gift comes to us as God's children in and through the gift of the cross. The gift. The unspeakable gift where God gave his only begotten son in human flesh. And God gave his only begotten son to the cross. God gave him to be ashamed. God gave him to pain and death and God gave up our sins to him by way of imputing them to his account so that he bore the punishment due to us for them and here is the cross it's a good gift it's a perfect gift it's from above it came down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning and in this one great gift Lumens all the other little gifts of providence and grace. We see they too are good and perfect, coming down from an unchangeable Father of lights. Believe and endure. Amen. Our Father in heaven, help us to understand and believe in thy word that we may overcome in our temptations and that we may believe thy goodness and believe the cross in the midst of the trials and pains of this present evil age. For Jesus' sake. Amen.